Welcome to the Bold SLP Podcast. We are so happy that you're here and can't wait to share with you all of the amazing conversations we've been having. We are the co-founders of the Bold SLP Collective, and we are also your hosts, Lisa, Desi, and myself, Ingrid. Each of us has a variety of experiences in all things bilingual and bimodal speech language pathology. You'll get to know us pretty well on here. We started this podcast to share our lived experiences, but also because we want to bring advocacy and cultural humility to the forefront of every speech therapy conversation. We hope that you'll join us each week, and we hope that you enjoy this episode. Hi, everyone. Welcome back. Um, Today, we'll be discussing being an SLP during a global pandemic. That's a heavy one today, Lisa. Mm Mm-hmm. Definitely. It's something that I, sounds like everyone on this podcast will have gone through. Everyone listening, at least. Yeah, definitely. So we'll be discussing where we were, what we were doing professionally and personally, um, mm-hmm. how the pandemic affected our practice and what we learned about ourselves. I so, can't wait. <laughs> you ready? I'm ready. Where were you when you found out the big news I think I was early to the party because personally my husband had traveled to a hot spot even before we knew what hot spots were so he had been to one of the cities and one of the airports where the first um, cases were reported so I was home with my sick husband trying to google everything I could about COVID before we even called it COVID. And so it was February 2020. And then we don't know still if he had COVID or not, because there were no COVID tests. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And then shortly after he was sick, my two daughters were sick. Oh, my goodness. So I was stuck at home February 2020 with my whole entire family sick. And I still don't know if it was COVID. But anecdotally, we feel like It's a really strong possibility just because of where he had been, how long Mm -hmm. he had been there, um, the timeline fit. So that's where I was. That's crazy, Ingrid. (laughs) I had no idea. Yes. And professionally, we had a plan. Um, The whole district was pretty proactive. We had planned for an extended spring break and for packets. So we had packets ready and then the students took their technology devices home with them for spring break in case we couldn't come back so that's where we were in March where we're like oh it's gonna be a long spring break it's gonna be fine but you know here are packets and take your computers and chargers home and plan for it to be extended if we need to so that's where we were Um, I was at Target Whenever the first case in my county was announced. Okay. And it was kind of like, oop. And that was probably the last time we went to Target for a long time. All of us together. So mm-hmm. well, you're yeah, obviously I have a traumatized by Target because you were there today before the podcast. No, I love Target. <laughs> this is not an ad, but <laughs> it's my no. <laughs> I, we all I love have a Target. picture. If you guys go to my Instagram, I have a picture of the girls at Target that last time when we felt it was safe, no masks or anything. And they are hugging the dog, the spot. We found the spot dog in one of the changing areas and they wanted to take a picture with it. Mm -hmm. And that's the last time we had a normal day. Wow. Mm -hmm. How about you, Desi? Where were you? Oh, I, to be honest, I don't have a clear memory of, um, I don't have a clear memory of when exactly we went into lockdown or I I remember the first time it impacted me that, you know, something big was coming. Uh, I was actually in Boston uh, with my husband and my son. Um, My husband was at a conference (laughs) with tons Mm -hmm. of people. Um, And it was understood that like, you know, we're supposed to all wash our hands, you know, um, sanitize our hands, not shake hands, not, you know, but none of the actual uh, measures had been put into place. Obviously, this was March, early March uh, 2020. 
And so it was just hitting us watching the news in the lobby surrounded by people, nobody masked or anything, nobody distancing, that this was just coming our way head on. Um, watching the news of like cases in Seattle. Um, and, um, and so we drove home, um, you know, the next day uh, back to Maine and it just kind of hit me in the car. I'm like, I don't know that we're going to go anywhere for a long time <laughs> or leave mm-hmm. the state for a long time. Um, so then quickly after that, things started changing, like within those two weeks or so. Um, one of my clearest memories is when my husband's university said, OK, we're going into spring break. And I mean, it was like literally the day before spring break. They said, never mind, you're not coming back. Mm-hmm. Just clean out the dorms. Go get your stuff you're going to go remote for the rest of the school year. I mean, which was such a crazy thing. Like everyone was still like responding to that. They're like, I, what does that mean? What does that look like? I mean, yeah. they just said, go home yeah. and stay there. Um, and then for me professionally, I was working in home health um, at the time and it was just the weirdest thing, you know, like we were supposed to be like these health professionals who had answers and understood this disease. And we were going into meetings still like all of us, 20, 30 people in a room, not masks, not distancing. And we were just talking about like, okay, well, what does this, what does this look like? You know, what, what is it doing to the lungs? What is it doing to the heart? Like, you know, what, what are some preventative measures? And so Again, like it, I just, I remember this like slow lurch toward figuring out, oh, well, we can't meet together ever again. (laughs) Or, well, you have have to go home. You have, we have to just meet on, you know, I think they were using Skype. Um, We have to just um, build up our PPE. So I, the the next thing I really remember was being home, um, all of us, all three of us. And I would just sit in hour long meetings every day at noon. Mm -hmm. waiting to get information because they were just trying so desperately to like gather PPE. I mean, nurses visits were still taking place, but all of the therapists were just waiting, waiting for, you know, and it it wasn't really clear. Like they didn't have like a full plan, but I think that was the case for a lot of these like home health based, you know, agencies just trying to figure out how do we keep our people safe? How do we not you know, circulate this respiratory illness among all of our patients who live in all these separate homes. Um, Mm. Just a weird time. Super bizarre. So weird. This is coming from like a fully private practice type of work, right? Or were you working in the schools? So actually this was completely medical. Right. Um, You mentioned nurses and stuff. So I was like, oh, I wasn't. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. It was actually an adult based, um, position. So I worked mostly with adults, some children every once in a while who were homebound, but, um, no, my, my, my patients were, I'd say 70 and up for the most part. Mm -hmm. And yeah. So a a rehab team. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. Like, especially knowing what was coming, you knew that it was coming for people who were immunocompromised, had health conditions. I mean, and that, that was everybody on my caseload. Oh my gosh. Yeah. (laughs) Because <laughs> we it forget was, that the pandemic was so long ago, like it started so long ago, because now I know you're in a fully different place working with fully different clients. So I didn't. Oh, wow. That's yeah. Really so that, yeah. And that's it kind of fed into that. Right. Like I, I started the pandemic in home health and I'm no longer in it. So that's kind of the beauty of this episode to share how that happened that I transitioned away. Mm-hmm. Um, but how about you? Well, I'm. I mean, we were talking about being introverted, extroverted. I feel like I'm a secret introvert, but I have many extracurricular activities that involve social groups and like I'm on a step team, I'm in the gospel choir. Like it was a huge shift, personally speaking. I mean, everything just shut down from one day to the next. I mean, I went from rehearsing with 60 people in a room to being on Zoom all of a sudden. So that that was different. I mean, Zoom wasn't even a word in my vocabulary. I was going to say, I did not know what Zoom was before the pandemic. Yeah. It's like a full word now. Are you, I'm going to Zoom you. I Zoomed him yesterday. Like, it's like, anyway. Yeah, the most um, quickly acquired verb ever. <laughs> yeah. Now it's forever in our vocabularies. But a little like you, Desi, I can't remember the exact like spot I was in when we got the news because I felt like it was like a gradual 
um, understanding of what was happening. I have some private clients that were like, I'm not sure if we're going to come next week. We're not feeling good with what's going on. They kind of alluded to, to like this disease that's spreading from different countries. And I, I, that was the first I'd heard of it. One of my clients' mothers mentioned to me that she didn't want her son going anywhere. They're not sure if they're coming back. And I mean, I had like a full caseload even before the pandemic. So I was like, you don't want to come. That's okay. I have someone else who wants to take the spot. So I didn't even think about it as shutting down everything. That was the first I heard of it. Then there was a pregnant girl at the office who was like, they just declared a global pandemic or she like made a statement like that. And I was like, who declared that? And she's like, oh, the WHO. Like, (laughs) who? The who? I didn't even mean that. That's funny. Um, Yeah. So it was, so that was the second thing. But even when she had said that I was still in schools that day and I went and um, I was at a school where the janitor was freaking out and was like, why are we still here? And children are coughing all over the place. And he was like really, really panicking. And I was just thinking, I mean, very wrongfully, what is he doing? He's causing so much panic. He needs to be quiet, you know, but he was right. A week later, I think it was, yeah, it was March break. And then, and then the whole extension, he was so right. All of us just stayed home. Um, I came from a family that like panics very often So I'm used to not taking panic very seriously. Like I just, I think people overreact a lot and I'm never sure, but this became more and more real as the days went on. And like, we couldn't even go to the office to pick up some stuff because they didn't know what kind of PPE you needed to have and just stay home, do your thing. So, so yeah, so professionally, I was just in a state of confusion, really. I don't think I was, you know, fearful at the time because I don't take panic seriously. Um, And Personally, it was very tough to shut down everything. We had just done our Montreal Steppers show at the end of February. And we had tickets to other people's shows. People came to support us. We were ready to support them in their in their shows. And all their shows got canceled. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it was interesting. Now, how did the, how did the pandemic affect our practices? Desi, I know you have a story because you kind of alluded to it. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so I guess what's fascinating um, about my experience in home health was, um, well, eventually my, my agency did b- build up their stockpile of PPE. And then once they did that, they're like, great, you guys are going back on the road. Um, so that was maybe about a week and a half in, two weeks. Um, it, it wasn't, it, 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 again, it felt like we were home for a long time, but I don't think I realistically was home for that long. Um so again, it just, it, it kept evolving like all the time. And that was what was hard to keep up with. Um, we had meetings all the time. We had pandemic meetings. I mean, uh, it's hard to do home health on the road, especially when you're expected to like stop by the side of the road and attend a meeting. Um, yeah. And so, you know, PPE was constantly changing. Um, at first it was just, okay, well, we're, uh, you know, the mask and you're going to wear the one mask for as many visits as you can. Um, and then you're going to put in a paper bag in between visits. Um, and then eventually it evolved to, okay, well now we have enough PPE that you can wear one mask per day. Um, and, but you're still going to keep that one mask, uh, same thing, throw it out at the end of the day. Um, and then eventually, um, when the general recommendation was for everyone to mask, including our patients, um, they started to make a plan to like give us half mass respirators, especially for patients who would refuse to mask. Um, well, in theory, they weren't supposed to refuse to mask, but you know, you always had a few who did, um, or people who couldn't mask. Um, so we eventually had half mass respirators, which if you've ever seen those, they look like gas masks because they have three filters, one on the front and then two on the sides. So doing speech therapy in a half mass respirator, <laughs> I mean, I felt I, I sounded like I was trapped in a closet, like two rooms <laughs> down. Um, nobody could hear me, um, especially my my elderly patients with hearing loss. So um, it was just, yeah, it was like an evolving challenge. You know, some people did do um, some Zoom visits with me, which was really nice. Um, I, I had never thought about or conceptualized how to do speech therapy through zoom um especially with adults like i felt like with kids you know you can pull some games out or 
you know, get them like to watch a video with you or something. But with adults, I was like, wait a minute, <laughs> how do I reconfigure this? Because usually I'm in their home and we're using stuff that they have. Um, so it, it was one of those things where, yeah, we had to pivot and think quickly. Um, and thankfully, the agency I worked for did a really nice job of allowing the people who were home to figure out how to manage that pivot, how to like consult with ASHA, how to figure out the best way to roll out something like this and how to do documentation for it. Um, so in that sense, like, I think, I think the hardest thing about home health was just the fact that it was constantly changing. I mean, there came a point too, where they're like, Hey, um, you know, we have, um, PAPRs, um, so positive airway pressure respirators. So mm -hmm. those are the ones that had the, um, it's like a, kind of like a helmet for your head kind of. And I, I apologize to all my medical SLPs out there who know what I'm talking about. And I'm just bumbling through the vocabulary on this. <laughs> um, but essentially you have the respirator on your back um, and then the air is filtered through um, the, the headpiece that you're wearing. So it completely covers your head um, and it allows you to not wear a mask. Um, or at least did at that time. And then eventually we were like, no, you're going to have to wear a papper and wear a mask. I mean, it, it was just always oh changing. <laughs> yeah. It was just every week was something new. So you couldn't miss out on meetings or anything. Mm -hmm. And I was part-time. So I always felt like I was like checking in with people like, wait, what's, what's the policy? What are we doing? Or the number of emails was like insane. Mm -hmm. Um, which I feel like must've happened to everybody, but, um, yeah. yeah, it made me realize like eventually how overwhelmed I was because in a in a sort of preventative measure, a lot of the hospitals in the area um, weren't necessarily taking on as many patients or they would be quicker to discharge people home. So the people that I would see in their homes were more acute than they ever would have been normally. So my visits yeah. would carry on sometimes like 45 minutes, an hour. I mean, I've had some visits that were ridiculously long. Um, and, and so I found myself in the position of taking blood pressures and reporting blood pressures to doctors and they were too high, you know, a call to the doctor extends your visit too. So anyway, um, you know, it just, it just felt like my life was, my professional life was kind of escalating into like this very medical, mm -hmm. you know, frail population. Um, and it just, it made it harder to go to work every day, um, so I really empathize with SLPs who are in hospitals who just day after day have been just working through this entire pandemic. I don't know how they do it. So shout out to them. But but that that was my evolution um, professionally in home health. Um, yeah. One of the reasons why I'm not there anymore. But <laughs> Oh, my gosh. I wonder if you would still be there if it weren't for the pandemic. Maybe. Um, I mean, I, I think... I think that a lot of people um, have that same experience, right? Of where would I be if I didn't, if this big event hadn't happened? And um, I don't know. Would you guys be in the same place? I don't know. I guess we should really go back and mm -hmm. see. I didn't go anywhere. I okay. stayed in the same place. You same. guys were the ones who changed a little bit. But I didn't go anywhere. But I'm so glad that you went first, Desi, because now I feel like I should not complain. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think Keep you were going to complain. Yes. I do think that change has happened, right? Like, even if you stayed oh, at the same yes. job, Ingrid. Yeah. I mean, can you I tell mean... us about what what flipped? What was your your big transition with, in your practice with the pandemic? Well, I think they quickly realized that the packets were not going to cut it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, even though our schools are amazing, they were literally dropping packets with the meals with the school buses. So the school buses would go to their designated bus stops with meals and with work for the children. But um, we have a pretty hefty system. We use Schoology already. So everybody was covered like second and up I feel like they know how to get their assignments and get on conferences and stuff for other normally normal things and then we were lucky because we have teletherapists in our district already so they really they were like invaluable to us whenever we had to make that shift because they already knew all the platforms the zoom the resources like the, we had so many meetings 
<laughs> I've never been in so meetings many meetings in my life. So many meetings about how to use Zoom, how to project, how to share your screen, how to give the children remote control and, you know, all those fun little things. And um, I was one of the few cynics because there were a lot of people who were like, oh, no, the pet is going to be like, you're forgiven for the year for the minutes. And I was like, I don't think so. I'm pretty sure we're on the hook for all the minutes that are on that IEP. Um, And so I was one of the first who was like, hey, if we can see our kids through Zoom, like, can we just start? Can we not wait for the platform to be perfect and for everybody to have the program and the landline? I'm like, can we just do it through the platform we already have? Because I don't feel comfortable. I don't feel like the pet is going to come back and say, you're good for the year. And sure enough, (laughs) we were on the hook for all of those minutes. And I was so thankful to not have kind of just taken it as a break. Um, I know a lot of surrounding school districts had to extend their school year because of that, because of the missed services. And we were not one of them. We tried everything. And we, I was pretty much seeing my whole caseload by week two. Um, because wow. all the kids were into it and then calling the parents. They all knew how to do Zoom, you know, after all of us being stuck at home for a couple of weeks. So we just got going. Uh, but at that time, my caseload was a lot more manageable. That was one huge change with budgeting and worries about all of that. I used to have a full-time SLP in my, in my setting, and now it's just part-time just like shortages. So that was a huge change for me. But um, I also had to learn really quickly because I had a CF depending on me that semester. It was her last section, right? So we had been together since May and it was March and she literally had (laughs) that section left. So I had to be on my toes for her. I had to make sure she was getting her hours that we were doing everything that Asha was recommending because she was an amazing CF and I wasn't going to let the pandemic derail her career, even if for, for a few weeks, you know. So it was a huge learning experience. If we were at home, uh, at first it was fine because my husband was here. Um, but as things, so we did a red, yellow, green stoplight thing in our state. So whenever we were in the green or yellow, then my husband had to go into work. Mm -hmm. If we were ever in the red, then he was like the first to be sent home. But when we were in the yellow or green, it was so hard. Like my daughter was three, my, my littlest and my oldest was seven. So it was chaos. It was chaos. Half the time I'm like doing a therapy session and muting myself to yell at somebody. It was, ugh. Oh, I man. I feel like I aged five years <laughs> that year. Um, luckily, they kept us virtual. So even when the kids would return, because we had a lot of like back and forth, um, our school, our schools opened in layers, like the neediest children. And then, you know, they would come in like smaller groups and the people who would like really needed to be at school. And then the people who could stay home would stay home. It was kind of like a, it was really a volunteer kind of system. Like if you can stay home, can you please stay home? So that the children whose parents have to work outside the home can come to school. So it was kind of like that. I I felt it was a strong community, I think, decision to go that way. So we stayed open all of that year uh, without a lot of cases um, I think we did good, but it was hard for me to be home. And then I went back in 2021, and I still have some virtual things to contend with, but um, I don't know. Nothing feels normal anymore, and I worry that it won't feel normal for a long time because of all the masks and quarantines. I know we haven't talked about that yet, but we were just in quarantine my daughter has missed probably 23 days of school this year being in quarantine 
That's... And we are only in November. Does she have an online? Um... Yes. So we have that little. Access. Okay. Yeah, we have that backup. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, we just all got through COVID, and it was my youngest who got COVID at her preschool, which she hadn't been to in a year. So we took her out at, when she was two and a half, and then she just got to go back, and she got COVID. A few months into it, I mean, when they're so little, and then she brought it to home to all of us. So we just got done being quarantined um, and missing a ton of everything. But like I said, nothing feels normal still, even though we're very lucky. And Desi, I feel like you said for the medical SLPs and medical providers, because it's bananas. I don't even know how they do it. I don't know. And I was going to say, just for our listeners, um, we were, all three of us were actually just all sick. Um, Poor Ingrid (laughs) was the one who got the positive COVID test, but I know uh, Liza, sorry, Lisa had um, her family get sick and then my family was sick. So we just all cycled through that. Um, So this episode felt really appropriate um, to speak to that. Um, (laughs) I mean, and I just, I, you brought back some PTSD for me, Ingrid. I was thinking about, (laughs) sorry, uh, (laughs) like one morning uh, I was on a meeting and my husband was on a meeting and my son was just not having any of it because he was, yeah, about um, 12 months old at that point. And so I was making breakfast. My son was screaming his head off. My husband was having his meeting as well. And it was just utter chaos. I mean, things that I just would never want to revisit ever again. I had to potty train my daughter because there were no diapers. Mm, oh, I had to potty word. train my daughter too. Not because there were no diapers. I, it was my choice. <laughs> but there was no toilet paper around, that's for sure. I mean, we were kind of pushing it. I mean, she's so she turns, she was two and a half, and we were kind of like there with it, you know. But when there were no diapers, and then the, the toilet paper came, and then the wipes went too, and I was like, okay. Like, this is it. I am not doing the cloth diaper thing. Like, you you need to be done. <laughs> <laughs> we have diapers for you to wear one per day at night. And that's it. Wow. <laughs> Figure it out, kid. I know. Figure it out. So much, so much that you said, Ingrid, resonated with me. Aww. But I, I want to mention that, like, I'm amazed at the kind of mentor that you are. Because you still had your student in mind, knowing fully well that, she had to give you grace. I mean, you couldn't possibly have all the hours that you were able to provide for her before the pandemic, but you were still like, no, we're going to get you what you need. So that's beautiful because yeah. a lot of supervisors here in Montreal just dropped their oh my gosh, their students because they're like, we don't know what we're doing and we don't know what we're teaching. And a lot of people were like against online, you know, telepractice, that kind of thing. They didn't think it would work. And I used to be in that camp before the pandemic. Like I wasn't interested at all in even learning how to work online. I was like, in person's always best. You know, the kids get their high fives, the hugs, the the toys. But I really changed my tune when this pandemic hit. And the just the sheer guilt I felt with every passing day of being paid and not working with children I, I just couldn't have it. So like you, I was like, I need to figure out the Zoom thing and I need, just need to know how to work with some kids. Right. And one thing that you said at the very beginning about these packets just not working. I mean, so many online tools were put in place. So many links were given to parents. So many things that, you know, me and my team and the psychologists and the ed consultants, like uh, the special ed consultants, they all came together and made these like amazing uh PowerPoints and things, but like Desi said, their emails were just saturated. Like their inboxes, I'm sorry, were just full, 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 full. So they couldn't keep up with all the links we were sending. And then we tried to put it all in one place, but then that page was so overwhelming for them because it was like 75 links. And often you need to know what um, difficulties your child is having to know which link to go to. And you need a professional for that. And we were not really available at the time. And it was, it was very messy at first. So my very kind boss was like, just take this time to catch up on your paperwork and your reports. And, you know, you have a young child at home. Just make sure she's safe and don't stress so much. And I was like, okay. So I 
I spent more time with Mila than I had ever spent. I mean, she was always in daycare and I was at work and it was beautiful. Like I, I got to, I got to potty train her. Like I got to hear the evolution of her language, like in real time. So that was, that was a really beautiful thing that I felt that I had. Um, but I feel because the original question is how it affected our practice. And I felt it sharpened my skills as an SLP because mm -hmm. once I was okay with Zoom and these parents opened up their screens and I saw what home life really looked like, I saw how useless my packages were. Mm -hmm. like, can you read a story for 20 minutes to your child when you have a three-year-old running behind you and a newborn and like the so TV's many, on. Yeah. Exactly. Right. The TV is on, you know, there are dishes in the sink. And Life is happening. I mean, yeah. My house is the same. Yeah. <laughs> and and just like just seeing what parents go through on a day-to-day -day basis mm -hmm. helped me provide appropriate recommendations that were doable and natural. And parents got to see me at work because that I, Right. And and mm. then parents took on the onus of repeating the strategy in real time and getting the feedback that they needed. And I was like, I have never done this before at the school board. It felt oh. like I was able to bring my private practice skills to the school board. I had parents involved. I, I was able to see families and like, you know, sometimes we would have a super great session and like the dad would walk by on his cell phone and have like a full conference call. <laughs> <laughs> and just like, you know, and his voice was like cutting out my voice and like, and we just waited like literally no hurry. Nobody's going anywhere. And it was, it was wonderful. And I yeah. like, not the pandemic itself, but the, the practice and learning how to just be a better clinician to the families that we're servicing yeah, I, I think it really positively affected my practice once I got over the fear of telepractice. Yeah. And I think that's what's really um, nice about the, the telepractice piece, like you were saying, just how much more you can individualize it. Because mm -hmm. um, I felt the same way um, in a lot of regards. Like, it was like, all right, well, we can't just sit here and like, like, not, we can't sit here and waste time in the sense that like, you have other things to attend to. So let's focus on what it is that you need, how it is that we can practice it, and then how you can take it and use it later um, because we need to capitalize on this time um, because you do have to get back to dishes and you do have to get back to your yeah. other kid. I, I felt like it was in that, like just how you said it, like mm -hmm. figuring out a Perfect. way to make it yeah. personalized. And parents yeah. will realize that doing dishes, sorry, Ingrid, while you no, go ahead, ahead. Well, parents don't realize that doing dishes or cooking with your child and all of that can be can definitely be a speech therapy goal. They were so used to like cue cards and booklets and, you know, mm. reading books word for word and like all these old school type of tips. Uh, but there was something else I want to say about um, Instagram and Facebook, actually, and what that did for me in my practice. But Ingrid, I think you want to say something. <laughs> I was just going to say that I'm glad you brought all that up because I think the major thing that changed in my practice that I wouldn't have mentioned unless you had shared yours is that parents finally know what I do. Yes. They yeah. finally see me do it. They've seen me how I, you know, take one, whatever sound their kid is working on, even something simple as our tick. And they're like, I see how you're cueing and why. And I understand Mm -hmm. Or, you know, I saw how you played that game with them and I saw that you weren't just playing, you know, because yeah. the kids go back and tell their parents very simplistic, you know, oh, we worked on this in speech or we played this in speech and they don't know why. But yeah. when they see you in action and they're like, I see what you're doing, why you're doing it. And then so getting those emails mm -hmm. are like what got me through. They're like, I saw the other day what you did. Can you send me that book so I can do it? Yes, oh, and I know exactly yes. what to do now that I saw you do it. Mm -hmm. The cutest thing was, so I had to have all of my sessions right at Mila's nap time. I couldn't have it before or after because she was just running around. But sometimes she would wake up early from nap and she'd come on screen. And I just became human to, to these people. Like we are yes. living the pandemic together. We are in the same boat it was always like I was this professional that they never saw until a results meeting, you know, and I came in with like this report and 
And it was such a different feel, like being being there, both of us, quote unquote, stuck at home, you know, and I liked it. I really liked it. But um, Ingrid, you mentioned that you already had like telepractice specialists at your, in your district. We didn't have that um, at my school board. Not that I know of anyway. Everyone was like, team, yeah. Zoom, what are we doing, you know? People didn't even like to FaceTime. I know I was the only one FaceTiming my friends before the pandemic. And they're like, why do you want to see this? And I'm like, why wouldn't you want to? But yeah, so wait, why am I mentioning that? Oh, because I had to search online to find other SLPs who knew what they were doing and, and were willing to share. And I met a whole community on Instagram a whole community and that's where I met all of you actually and then Clubhouse yeah. um, actually that's where I met Ingrid and then Clubhouse Desi but all of that happened because of the pandemic like mm -hmm. everything I am now as a professional I can directly relate back to the pandemic right it's crazy. and actually I wanted to mention that too and I, I can't believe I forgot I left that out but I'm so glad you mentioned that because that's exactly where I started making more connections with people. And one of the reasons that I left home health was because of the fact that now I could, you know, I knew that there was just so much more opportunity to like work online or, um, you know, I, I really went down this road of thinking about starting my own practice because I realized that I was taking risks and I was working um, in these situations where I really didn't necessarily want to be. Mm -hmm. And there were so many more opportunities that I could just reach out and do um, without risking my health or without having to go into people's homes. Mm -hmm. um, and so part of that, you know, part of putting that plan into motion was connecting with people. And I went on Facebook and I started asking questions in groups. Um, I built up uh, an Instagram um page and I, I wasn't planning on I, I I literally like started it I put up a picture and I was like okay I'm here this is just so I can follow people uh, who are SLPs and not have it like crowd my personal one um, and then from there um, I realized like hey well I should post I really want to engage with this community um, and I say this now when I haven't posted anything in months but uh, <laughs> you got other things going on I do have other things going on but I I still love the community I still get messages like even people just commenting on stories that I've shared and it's just so enriching like you were saying I've learned so much and I think it's made me a better person um just being able to see what other people are doing up, you know upgrade my practice learn about things that are you know up and coming um it's kept me way fresher than I think I've ever would have been on my own so you almost kind of went on to our last question so what did oh. you guys learn about yourselves as an SLP and as a person through this? Well, I learned that I was doing too much. Too many times uh, writing reports with details that really didn't matter, putting in paragraphs because they seemed professional, but parents would just skim right over them or not understand them. So for sure, I learned about doing too much <laughs> and doing not necessarily the bare minimum, but efficiently working with only the things... <laughs> <laughs> we've got a visitor for our yeah. pandemic podcast She's whispering at me why is this taking so long oh we're <laughs> almost done my friend That's yeah. what I told her. <laughs> well I'm gonna just piggyback off of you Lisa because mm -hmm. I feel the same way like I I I questioned a lot of things you know and I think that having a, a new community having other opportunities just you know with teletherapy changing with my own priorities shifting um, I really started questioning like, well, what, why, why do I do this? And why does this matter? Or, you know, why is it expected that I should do X job and see X many clients and work myself till, you know, X number of hours each day? Um, I, I couldn't do it anymore, especially, you know, having a family. Um, and we live away from our families, like our parents and stuff. So mm -hmm. it was just too much. Um, and so I'm grateful for the COVID-19 pandemic for showing me that it was too much and that there were more efficient ways of managing my time, just like you said. Mm -hmm. oh, what about you, Ingrid? And your little one can answer too, Shima. Yeah, Amelia's here. I'm going to get a little philosophical about what I learned about myself, about an SLP, because you know that my personal learnings are like, I just don't give a crap about as much as I used to. <laughs> but... About being an SLP, 
the pandemic taught me that I need to step it up, that my visibility, my voice, um, I learned the phrase, take up space. Yes, I didn't know that I needed to take up space for my community until the pandemic and Instagram. I didn't know that me being visible to future SLPs who are Mexican American was important. And so that has been my biggest lesson through the pandemic and through this like influx of being in social media connected through social media because we're all stuck at home and not doing all our normal things. But Mm-hmm. Yeah, me. that was I'm, major realization for me. I'm, I'm um, not stuck at home. You're not stuck at home. <laughs> okay. I'm going to Gigi and Papa. Yes, you're going to Gigi and Papa's. Um, but that has been my major, you guys. I didn't know that anybody wanted to hear from me. I was just here in my little happy corner, small town, um, making change here, of course, because mm-hmm. it's within me. But I didn't know that. I needed to make that visible and make myself available and for mentorship, which I love. So you did an incredible job. You did an incredible job representation wise, visibility wise. I'm going to coin your word for you as visibility. Yes. That's (laughs) my last word. That's your last word. And mine is going to be efficiency. What about you, Desi? I think questioning. I'm going to stick to that one. Questioning. So we have questioning, question everything, <laughs> questioning, <laughs> efficiency, and visibility. Yes. What will our next episode be about, Desi? Uh, so actually, this is a perfect transition right here because yeah, next episode okay. we'll be talking about how social media brought us together. So I'm glad we didn't go <gasps> further into the details, into the weeds, but I think it's going to be a great um, episode to follow up on this one. Thank you for listening and supporting the Bold SLP Collective. You can find a closed captioned version of this podcast on our YouTube channel. We will also have show notes on our website. If you enjoyed this episode, we'd really appreciate it if you do all the podcast things. Follow, subscribe, download, and review. And don't forget, we love hearing from you. So connect with us on Instagram at the Bold SLP Collective. Stay bold and humble. See you next time.